<laughs> okay, let me read the verse and then I'll get your question, okay? Uh, Philippians 2.15, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. So that definition, 144,000, should be the definition of us today, and that's what we're being told in Philippians. And we know we're not sinless. It is not that we aren't perfect. I do like the bumper sticker, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Now, that doesn't mean go do whatever you want. doesn't matter because you're forgiven. No. If you want to please him, be without fault. Be blameless. Show a life that is cleansed in the blood. That's our duty as we present ourselves a living sacrifice under our God and allow him, him to conform us to his image. Our Lou, question. Yeah, so the first fruit would be like when God, okay, you said, well, of course, you know, not that they're sinless, so it would be God looking at them like Eden, Adam and Eve, and Eden, innocent and righteous. You could say that. She's asking me because they're first fruits and God's looking at them like they're sinless um, because innocent it's a gift. And, innocent yeah. and righteous? In, innocent and righteous. Innocent and righteous. They definitely were innocent in the garden. Adam and Eve, that's where she took it. She's asked me. And they were looked upon, I guess, as righteous. They had the, the glory of the Lord about them because right. they were made in His image. Mm -hmm. And there's reason to believe that and this is a sidetrack, so I won't go into it any more than just the, the comment. And for some of you, it may be a real eye-opener, and you may go, oh, wait a minute. And that's okay, <laughs> because there's nothing concrete. But it does give us the idea, when we get into the depth of the meaning of the words there in the Hebrew, that there was some sort of a glory shroud around Adam, around Eve. And when sin entered into them, that was gone. That's why it can be said, we know that Satan deceived Eve, but Adam willingly took. He could even see the change in Eve and willingly took anyway. Not anything we can take and hang doctrine on, nothing that we can take and say, here's exactly it, but it yields itself to that. So in that sense, I would say then, yes, Adam and Eve were looked on as innocent and righteous before sin entered. Um, and when you think of many first fruits, realize um, and I have, to, I have to realize maybe you don't have that Jewish mind yet. Every time there's a crop, every time there's a harvest, you have a harvest in spring, you have a harvest in fall, they're to bring the first fruits to the Lord. If they plant a tree, no one eats the fruit from that tree for three years. It's allowed to be just nurtured and babied and not expected to be really producing well for three years. And then the first fruit is taken to the temple and it's given to the Lord. Then the family eats of the tree. So there are uh, times repeatedly that first fruits are brought to the Lord. There are ceremonies called first fruits. We've gone through them during the year, but many, many times, many first fruits. Okay, now, we've got them being first fruits to the Lord. We've got them being innocent in the sense that they live pure, they live blameless, they live like they're cleansed in the blood. The Gentiles, we're, we, we've said they're Jewish. We've said that they're on a Jewish evangelism mission, which brings in the Gentiles too, but their thrust is to the Jews. We know that that is the way that, that Scripture brings it out clearly to us. This is the time of the Gentiles. The net's cast out to the Gentiles. Jewish people get caught in that net too. Hallelujah, I'm one. <laughs> Now we've got the, the flip again, and we're back to, it's going to the Jews, but hallelujah, the Gentiles are caught in that net also and able to be brought in. God never excluded one of the peoples from salvation, never. And the salvation is only all the way through, from a dome to the end of time, the only way saved is through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. It is not dual covenant, which is a whole nother they call it theology. I don't even want to call it a theology. It's just so false. It isn't funny. So we're not advocating that either. But the Gentiles are going to be judged. And we'll see this. We'll look at it in Matthew 25 in a moment. They're going to be judged on their treatment of these Jewish people during this tribulation period. So as 144,000 Jewish people go out, even though God has sealed them so that they can do their job, that does not mean that, that Satan's not going to be after them to kill them. The last thing he wants is 
a great evangelistic campaign, Reaping Souls. He wants to take as many to hell with him as he can. He knows he's going to end up in hell, and I think the audacity of his attitude is, well, I will take as many as I can with me. And so he goes after them with a vendetta. So how the Gentiles treat them will be weighed in the judgment that they receive after this period of time is over. Let me take you to Matthew 25 to show this to you. We'll start with verse 31, Matthew 25, 31. Now, if you've been with me long enough, you know that Matthew 24 and 25, I believe, are very much orderly chapters mm -hmm. that reveal following. Okay, Rowena's got a question. I'll catch you in just one moment. Um, but I, I see it orderly. By the end of 24, you have the second coming. So 25, when it goes into different, um, like parables, there, there are different judgments that are happening. We're going to look at this one in relation to what I'm just saying. Rowena, try unmuting yourself. Roger hasn't come back in from working on the sound. So, oh good. Okay, your question? No, my question is, um, this 144,000, they were sealed. Yes. Um, and this is already the time of the tribulation. Yes. Could it be that they were sealed with the Holy Spirit? Because at that time, there's no Holy Spirit anymore. I mean, the Holy Spirit can overshadow you just like in the Old Testament times. But right. this 144,000, they are like indwelt just like the church was when, when we got saved. Could it be that way? Um, in a sense, because we know they're doing their... their um their duty, their their job, whatever I should be calling it, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it tells us that they're sealed on their forehead with the name of their God. The reason why I point that out is what do we see Satan do? Take my mark. You have to take my mark in your forehead or in your hand. So he's counterfeiting God once again. So they're definitely sealed in, in a tangible way that can be seen, I believe, in their foreheads with the name of God. But you are absolutely right that it is the Holy Spirit is indwelling them in the way I would say yes, like we are today, where He's in them continually for them to be doing the work that they are doing. So I, I believe you're also right, you know, because the Holy Spirit's not going to be leaving them at that time, and He is our seal. That is how it is described in Ephesians one. He is our seal until we are home. He's our engagement ring, you know, he, he, which was as good as marriage. Um, so, yes, I think you can liken it that way, Rowena. Okay, verse 26, I'm sorry, verse 31 of Matthew 25. I don't know where I got the 26. Verse 31, Matthew 25. But when the Son of Man comes in all his glory. Now, Son of Man is a very Jewish messianic title. So we know we're talking about Yeshua Jesus. When he comes in all his glory, we know that's his second coming. That as we, re we see the rest of what will happen, we know this is not rapture. When he catches us up and we go back into heaven with him. Because this is when he comes. And he comes and all the angels with him. We also know we will come with him from Revelation 19. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. This is what he does not do at rapture time. He doesn't come down to earth and sit on his throne. He's going to go back up into heaven. He's just taking us home. That's all. He, we, we've been met. It's, it's even the way it was done. An entourage went out when someone important was coming into the city. There were the representatives who went out to them and brought them in through the city gates. Well, the Lord is so welcoming us home that he's come out to meet us and brings us through the gates into the presence of our holy God and our Savior forever. Hallelujah. But here it's talking about when he comes. His angels are going to come with him, put out the, the, well, he mainly puts out the battle that's going on, but then he sends those angels to the four corners of the earth to draw his people into the land where they're going to live for a thousand years in Shalom. Never in Israel's history. I don't think they've had a thousand days in a row, but they definitely never had a thousand years. So at that time, verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him. Now if he's sitting on his throne and the angels have gone out to bring the, the people home, we know he's sitting on his throne in Israel. 
We know that it comes back to the Mount of Olives. We know that the temple is set up in Jerusalem. So there's no question where he is. He is sitting in Jerusalem, comma, Israel. So if it's saying all the nations are gathered before him, obviously it's not talking about Israel. They're being gathered to him in Israel. Now, Israel's there, but it, t we're talking about the nations around, okay? All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, okay? Now, this is where I believe also he's bringing those who are in Israel into this judgment that's here, and he's going to separate them. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he'll put the sheep on his right, he'll put the goats on the left. Now, before I go further with it, remember who are the sheep. Do you remember Yochanan John 10? My sheep hear my voice. They know and they follow me. So when he's putting the sheep on his right, he's putting those who know him and who have followed him. He's putting the believers, the believing ones, on his right, and he's calling them his sheep. The goats are the infiltrators. The goats are the ones that are not the believers. They're on his left. Verse 34, then the king, Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, then the king will say to those on the right, to the sheep, come, you are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is what God had planned all along, and his plan is being played out. The nation of Israel will see this, where his sheep, those who are believers, will be brought in to live out now in the kingdom that was prepared for them. We go on with that thought in mind. Keep your Jewish mind on. For I was hungry. Now who's talking? We've got the Lord talking, don't we? So the Lord's saying, I was hungry. Okay, and the Lord, in his humanity, was Jewish. He came born into the Jewish family of David. We see his, his inherited uh, right to the throne because he was of the tribe of Judah. So he is saying, I was hungry, I, and you gave me something to eat. He's talking again to the Gentiles around him. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger, invite you in, naked, and clothe you? When did we see you sick in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, so with your Jewish mind now, he's talking to the Gentiles. He will say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. So who are his brothers? They're his Jewish kinfolk, because we're keeping that line of thinking all the way through this. Those of you who helped the Jews in the tribulation period, when they were being hunted down by the Antichrist, because he's going to go after the Jews, and he's going to go after the believers. Revelation 12 tells us that, that he goes after those who have the testimony and who kept um, the commandments of God. So we see both groups there. We see the Jewish ones, we see the believers. Some are Jewish believers, they fit in both groups. But he, he is referring to that time when you, were persona, you are persona non grata in the tribulation. Why? Because they're not taking the mark. They're not going along with the beast, and he's going to be hunting them down. So they can't go into the store and buy food. If, if somebody isn't feeding them on the side, they're not going to survive. The Lord's saying, you did it to them. You saw those who were in need. You saw my kinfolk. You saw my believing kinfolk also, and you fed them. You clothed them. You visited them in prison at, at the chance that your own neck would be chopped off because you showed concern and you helped these. The same way I see to a smaller degree, but the same idea, there were those that lived near the concentration camps that would go down to, to where the uh, wires were that kept the prisoners in, and they would throw food over. They knew the people were starving. They could see it. And they would throw food, and there were those who were close to the, the wires that were able to get that food. And for some, it literally was the way they survived. That gives you a, an example of what it will be like during this time. But do you see how he says to them, 
they're rewarded with coming in because they helped these, they helped his brothers. So their treatment of the Jewish people during the tribulation is rewarded in the millennial. Now, did he say it's what saved them? No. No, salvation is in Yeshua Jesus. Reward is for what you've done for Yeshua Jesus. And there's your difference. It's not that they were saved by meriting, <coughs> by doing a good act. But they are rewarded with the kingdom. They're rewarded with the blessings that were meant for Israel. They will come in as righteous Gentiles. Go to Yad Vashem in Israel. And you have a huge now. It was very small when I first saw it in, in the 70s, late, late, late 70s. Um, and now when I saw it in 2019, it's huge. The Garden of the Righteous at Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is a, a memorial to the Holocaust, lest it ever be forgotten and repeated. And here in the Garden of the Righteous are trees planted for every Gentile who did what they could to spare the Jews. Corey Ten Boom, Raul Wallenberg, people like that. And they've done much more to make it beautiful, to honor them, to honor their memory. It's their way of thanking them and of bringing them in and showing that, that they flourished because of these people. Well, this is what the Lord is doing. Come on in. Be blessed in my kingdom. Receive the blessings that were meant for the Jewish people because you have done this for them. Now, I told you it did not save them, and it did not. But let me ask you. Would they have stuck their neck out to save a Jew or a believer if they were not saved? And I think the answer is a flat out no. They're going to be so busy fighting for their own survival. They're going to have taken the mark, which again and again and again, I, I stress to you, they don't accidentally take this mark. They don't say, oh, well, this is my best pass, or this is my pass to buy food in the grocery store. They know when they take that mark that they are pledging allegiance to the Antichrist. They are worshiping him when they take his mark. It's not done by accident. They know what they are doing. They are not going to help who they'll see as the enemy to this one that they're giving their worship and their allegiance to. They'll hunt them down also. But the believers who have not taken that mark, who maybe aren't in the position that they've been hunted down yet, who maybe were knew it ahead and were able to hide out more food and so forth, they'll be involved in the helping. So while I fully believe that it's believers who will do it, it is not what made them believers. It's not what saved them. Okay, I think that's clear. If there aren't any questions, we are done with our 144,000. I have yeah. a question. The movie Schindler's List. Schindler's List. Schindler's. He was really not a Christian, but he had a heart for the Jews. Now, since he wasn't a Christian, he would not get rewarded for doing what he did, unless he, in a you know, they sense, hung him. But I don't think he was ever born again. Okay. In a sense, he still would. The question asked to repeat to all of you: Schindler's List showed Oscar Schindler who was not a believer as far as the movie brought out, as far as anyone could tell. But he rescued many, saved many from death, Jewish people during the Holocaust. If you don't know the story, it's hundreds. that He put to work in his factories. He fed them. He, it was his way of trying to rescue. And I think he's the one that said he wished he had done more, if yeah. I remember right. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So Pam is asking me, you know, well, if he wasn't a believer then he really doesn't get rewarded for doing that. Well, in a sense he does because the non-believer will stand before God for judgment for the actions that they did. So Hitler is going to suffer greatly because he took life. He did horrors. And someone like Schindler, who did good and who did save, will have a less horrible judgment. judgment. They still are not saved, mm -hmm. but their judgment will not be to the degree of someone like Hitler. Mm -hmm. I can't fully understand that. Those are the ones my heart breaks for. Yeah. Um, I think to myself of the example of Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, his brother Yanni. He spearheaded and led and led his men into the Entebbe rescue. He was one of the masterminds behind it. Brilliant, like his brother Bibi. 
Netanyahu. Um, he lost his life in that raid. He was the only, well, there was a couple hostages that lost their lives for different reasons. But he was the only in the Israeli um, army that was in on it that lost his life. And it seems so unfair that the one who did this, who rescued the people, who had this brilliant mind using it, you know, for God's people, you want to hint someone like that to be saved. But see, that's our human reasoning, and that's the way we're looking at it. I hope Yanni was saved. I have no idea, because it never has it been brought out in uh, anything written where I could read it. No, but I do know that we do hear sometimes of people. I know that there is a testimony out there of Golda Meir, that I expect to meet Golda Meir in heaven one day. Hallelujah. But all I can tell you is when we see the unsaved stand before God, in that great white throne judgment, we're not going to see a good person who was sweet and loving and helped many people. We're going to see an enemy of our Savior, the one who gave his life for us. We're going to see an enemy. We're going to see one who came against them. Because if you are not for Messiah, you are against Messiah. There's not an in-between. We talk about a fence, and they're hanging on the fence because we see them getting close. And we say, jokingly, we want to push them over. But if they were to lose their life on that fence, their life is without Christ. He alone is the righteous judge. And he is not going to be unrighteous in his judgment. So where we don't understand, we'll wait and see. When we have the mind of the Lord, we'll understand. And we'll see a fairness 100% across the board. Our look at Yeah. We're under... What's that? We are under grace. We are under grace. So what you said doesn't fit the for us said. today. No. But we're talking about great tribulation where we understand it that this period will be under the law. Yes. Therefore, they will be rewarded, believer or not. But uh, I'm thinking of David mm -hmm. who married a bride, Abigail, mm -hmm. who helped him. Mm -hmm. not She's not a believer. So I see that as an example. Okay, she, she's bringing a how during the tribulation, they're under law again, and they're judged according to that law also because that's the time they're living under. It's not the age of grace like it is for us now. And she bring, brought out the example of how David took in Abigail as his wife. She stood for David, even though she was not a believer. She wasn't one of the faith, but she, she was brought into the family of God. And I would hope one like Oscar and one like, um, who else I mentioned just a bit ago, um, would, that, that they, if they have a tender heart that way, I think they're reachable for the Lord. And here is where I know my Lord stops at nothing short to bring salvation to every soul. If he was willing to, to leave heaven, take on human form, to be born from a virgin, in poverty, she was not born, he was not born in the palace, he was born in the stable, to live a life mostly of rejection, of, of misunderstanding by those around him. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And he did that solely to die for us, that he might save the world. It's each one's individual choice, but it says, for God so loved the world. If he went to all that degree, what's more than his giving his life? What's more than leaving heaven and giving his life? What's more than being God who created the universe and now is saying, I'm going to trap myself in one of my creations. And I'm going to do that for all of eternity. Because do you realize the Son of God will have that resurrected body form for all of eternity? That he's not just spirit form like God the Father, although we see God the Father and that's another great mystery for another class. But do you understand what I'm saying? He slipped in a time and space. He confined himself. That he might, he became one of us. Here's the analogy. A man was walking. He had a big boot on. He's bringing that boot down when he suddenly sees it's going to come down on an anthill. And the little ants are scurrying even just from his shadow and probably the impact of the wind that's coming against them. But before he smashed that, that ant hill flat, he pulled his foot back. And he said, oh, the lambs, you don't need to worry. I'm not here to kill you. 
And he thought, how can I get that across to them? They're still scurrying. They're still panicky. They're still in fear of the impending dropping boot. And he thought, if I could become an ant, then I could tell them. Well, that's what God did. He became a human that he could tell us and he could save us. That's an amazing love. If he went to that degree, do you think he'd stop short of sending an angel to that person in their last moments of life on this earth? We're the ones with the attitude, well, they defied you this long. They don't deserve it. That's a horrible attitude, people. If that's your attitude toward anyone, I pray God's grace come upon you in a way that you have not understood it yet. Because by God's grace, he saved us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't do 100,000 right acts and then get saved. We didn't live just right. We didn't look just right for him to save us. How dare we say that someone else, because they've been ornery, don't deserve his salvation in the last moments. And if you ever, ever catch a glimpse of hell, I don't believe you can have that hard heart. I just absolutely don't believe you can. I don't want to dwell on it. I don't want to go here because I want to go back to here. But in short form, I lived through a house fire next door to where I lived. And that house fire took the life of the husband. And um, they were adult children, but the, the father of four in that fire. We knew he was in there. We raced in to try to get him out, not knowing he, his life was already gone. In that glimpse, it's still this day. I, I tell you honestly, right now I'm covered in goosebumps from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. It still rattles me. I saw a glimpse of horror, a fire that's horror, a suffering that comes from fire. I saw darkness in the midst of fire at the same time. How do you have pitch black with fire raging? I can't explain it to you, but it grabbed hold of me. It troubled me because of the loss of life. And a week later, in, in Bible class, up came the subject of hell. It literally took my breath away. And I thought, if this is that horrible, how much more hell? That this is it forever. Nobody comes out of this. It never ends. It's the absence of love. It's the absence of light. It's the absence of glory. It's the absence of grace. If you catch that, and I feel like my words are just not even scratching the surface of what I want to convey, you could not wish that on anyone. I don't think you could have that hard, that evil of a heart. And if you do, I think you need to pray for your own salvation because I don't believe you could have God's love and be that hateful toward the world. Now, having said that, I'm not a perfect person. I can't say I love Hitler because of what he did to my people. So I am a work in progress. And I do believe that hell was made for the devil and his angels, yes, but there are those who do deserve. When a false prophet and an antichrist are thrown into the lake of fire forever with Satan, I'm going to be in the choir singing hallelujah. <laughs> so don't get me wrong. You know, we, when we see the enemy of our Savior, that's when we want justice done, but in the right way, not out of this attitude that I think isn't, isn't right before God. He loves that one. He, I think he cries over those he loses. I think it breaks his heart. And if it doesn't break your heart, and if my words don't make you feel right now, get out there and share it because you know what if we go home today or tomorrow they've got seven years left and they're going to have to live through hell on earth now i want to get them out i want to get the message out i want to save them if you see a bridge out and you just want to watch the cars go off and fall off and and laugh at their they're falling into to that destruction god help you because if you're his, he's going to correct you. And if you're not his, you need salvation too. I want to be, wait, the bridge is out. Look out. You know, there's something coming here that's horrible. Stop. 
hold on, let me spare you this tragedy. And in my final words, I'm reminded of my dad, who was Jewish missionary, for any who do not know. He was witnessing to one, who was witnessing to the family. There was one in the family who was saved, the rest still were not. And one became very, very angry with him. Now, this one does have an anger issue. I'll, I'll give you that much. But in his anger and, and spewing his anger and his hatred toward my dad, and my dad still trying to reach him out of love, said to this person, I'm not going to call him out by name, pray for his salvation, he's still alive. He said, if someone knew, if I knew that your house was on fire, would you want me to tell you? And, of course, this man answered back, well, of course. And I'm thinking, see, because this fire next door is so real to me. I get that. And so he said to him, I believe your spiritual house is on fire. That's what he was trying to show him. Now, instead of it reaching this one, he lunged at my dad in all the more anger. And he hardened his heart at that moment. But he's still alive, and I still pray, and I still believe that there could be the day he'll walk up to my dad in heaven and say, thank you. You told me, and it was a fur in my side, and I hated you for it, but now I love you for it. Don't stop short. If you get a little bit of suffering, consider it a compliment that the Lord's allowing you to know what he went through for us. Realize he can't trust that to just everybody. He can't trust that to a little flimsy, scary person or a little prima donna. <laughs> but he can trust it to his soldiers who are willing to go through the trenches for him. Okay. Um, Roger. When we, at one point, we were talking about Benny Britt. Talk loud. When we were talking about Benny Britt. Okay. And we never knew whether he was saved or not because of the way he was. And everybody kept trying. But towards the end, when he was at home, and was it Billy Graham that was on? And it wasn't on that channel before. It was like, boom. Oh. Yeah. Can I jump in? Yeah, that was okay. Roger. Roger Sherry, about an unsaved Jewish man that my dad started with, 1957, 59, 60, somewhere in there. And you were fast forwarding into the 2000s. So for many years, he'd had a witness. My dad goes home to heaven, and I was given the privilege of carrying on with him. He had someone in his life who was a, a believer, and she would try to witness to him. She met well. She didn't exactly know how to talk to a Jewish person. She'd get him flustered. He'd get upset at her. This was back and forth all the time. But we kept, all of us kept working on, you know, as God would give us opportunity. He was in the hospital a couple of times before. He did lose his life here. And even my brother, who hit him man to man and talked to him as only Mike Pearl's kid could have done. <laughs> you know, went after him. But he was stubborn. He, he just, I'm a good person. I've lived a good life. I've helped everybody I could. You know, surely God's going to let me in heaven was his attitude. And even though we knew he was ill, it was a sudden and unexpected death. And when we first heard it, in all actuality, to be brutally honest, I reeled because I loved him. And I thought, I, I don't know where he is. I'm afraid of where he is. And I was spiraling downward, praying, God, if he is with you, if you can give me any sign, I need this. It, it was taking my breath away. And what Roger reminded us, of, mm -hmm. the woman that was the Christian that he didn't appreciate was with him in his home. She would stay overnight. She'd stay in her own bedroom. He stayed in his, but she was in that house. And because she's Christian, she'd turn on Christian TV, and she'd turn on Christian TV, and it happened to be Billy Graham that night. Whether you like him or not, I do. I've got an uncle in heaven because of him, and I hope I've got Benny in heaven because of him. Out of his normal character that night, in his giving the message, he said, whether you are Jewish or whether you are Gentile, this is for you. Now, he didn't say that every week, every message, but he did on this night. And this gal turned to Benny at that point, and she said to Benny, Choose Jesus. Choose life. Now, normally those words he would have bristled. It would be the automatic reaction, and, ah, you know, I don't want to hear it. 
and she said as she looked back she didn't even remember it took her a little bit of time because she was spinning over his death also but she realized you know when I said that to him he sat there quietly and he smiled at me he didn't argue he didn't get mad and there was a smile and we all are holding on to that as our hope that there was a change in Benny, that he had made his peace with his Lord. That was the 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock hour, and by 3 a.m., he had left this earth. Don't ever give up. Don't ever quit. If God puts it on your heart, go. Talk. Speak for him. What are you going to say? The Lord says, don't premeditate it. Open your mouth and I'll fill it. That's right. Just go. That's Just right. go. He uses the weak. He uses the shy. He uses the, what have I got mm -hmm. to give? Mm -hmm. Just go. Just go. Mm -hmm. Beautiful are the feet that shed the gospel of good news. Pam? Yes. Uh, my cousin died two years ago. Well, not two years ago. She's two years younger than me. And she passed away. She's Mormon. And I talked to her mom. And her mom said, well, she was a good girl. And, of course, we all know that good, good people girl, don't stone. go to heaven, only save people. Right. And I wish I could have thrown her a lifeline, but I didn't. But you weren't there having that opportunity. Now, here's where I derailed with what I was saying. Do you believe that if an angel stood there and threw her the lifeline, that if she would have come to the Lord, do you believe the Lord would have sent an angel? Probably not, because she was so brainwashed in them. That's you judging where she was at, but you don't know that. In those last moments, you don't know what's going on in their that's mind. True. And I believe if an angel preaching the gospel would come to them, God sends that angel. Why? Mm -hmm. Because, again, what would he stop short of? What do we see in Revelation? When the 144,000 are going out witnessing, we also have the angel flying through the heavens preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. I believe he is speaking it out and it's falling on this earth. If he goes to all the trouble in the tribulation period, why would he not go to someone in their last moments if they would listen? Mm -hmm. Why would he not go? Again, long story short. So if he my, sent her an angel, she would have been saved. If she would have believed, I believe he would have sent her an angel with the gospel, giving her that opportunity for her to say in her mind, not consciously where, where we're hearing, but in her mind, I, I open my heart to you to be my savior. And then she'd be in heaven and you'd have no knowledge of it because she didn't come back mm -hmm. physically to be able to share it. To share it. Yeah. yeah. You never know. My dad's awakened in the middle of the night to go to the um, ICU room of, of a, again, an unsafe Jewish man he's been witnessing to for years, who literally is in his last hours of life. I do not believe God would awaken my dad and send him if he had made a final rejection and there was no hope. I do not believe God would have done that. But God sent my dad in, sent him in. He got in his ear. He preached the gospel to him again. This man is in a coma. He cannot respond. Yes. But my dad stayed there and, and poured out his heart until he felt like the Lord said, Okay, now go. And this man, a couple hours later, left this earth. I have high hope he's in heaven. Because why did God send my dad if it was all over? It's not. It's not the thief on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say, get off the cross and go do something for me and I'll consider. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. I hope this is blessed and helped somebody. It was not on track. It was not intended. But I just feel when these things come up, we're not here for an agenda. We're here to learn together. And if this encourages you and if it lights a fire to you to get out there and be a witness, hallelujah. How much longer do we have to do it? Not much. Absolutely not much. Chill, can I ask a quick oh, question? Oh, you wanted in there earlier. Forgive me. <laughs> I tend to forget things. You guys need to holler again like Ann just did. Please, Ann. Yes, ma'am. Oh, just a quick question. Um, we, were, we were talking about um, the believers that the Lord would um, respond to who helped the Jewish people during the tribulation, right? The Gentiles, yeah, I believe they, they're believers to do it right. because they're the risking life right. and life. The Gentiles. Now, are those people who came to know the Lord after?
the rapture? Very good question. Let me make that real clear. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. So when, these are people who may have received seeds of encouragement and information before the rapture. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> I'm on my soapbox. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> um, let's see if we're coming into it close enough. We may not be. We, we, we could come to in case if we don't. What she's bringing out, and I want to bring it out very, very clearly. When the rapture occurs, and if you don't like the word rapture, that's fine. That's a Latin word for rapture, I can't even say it. I don't care. The great snatching away, whatever you want to call it. When the Lord comes for the believers, takes us home to be in heaven, his feet do not stop on the Mount of Olives. He's in the heavens, we meet him in the heavens, we go home to be with him. That is the body of Christ being caught up together. Now, let me ask you, if we're one body, and are we not told that we are all one body, that the, the Lord is our head and we are his body, we're one body. If that body is caught up, does he leave behind a finger or a toe? Does he leave behind a leg or a kidney? <laughs> Now, I'm sounding facetious, but get my point. Every single person who has saving faith, who has put their faith in Yeshua Jesus for salvation, hears that shofar blow and hears those words, and I believe those words on the basis of Revelation 4, when a picture, I believe, of the rapture, we're going to hear it come up here. I think that's what we'll hear. Maybe not exactly those words, but it's certainly going to mean that. Everyone who is his, all my sheep who hear my voice, follow me. They know me because they know my voice. Remember the sheep, the shepherd that I told you about, the two shepherds that the, the sheep intertwined, and the person watching thought, how will they ever know whose sheep is whose? How will they ever separate them? And when those shepherds wanted to separate their flocks and go their ways, one went off talking and one went off singing. And you watched, he watched, the, this person who told the story watched those little sheep scatter to get to whichever was their shepherd to follow their shepherd. The Lord does not lose one. He says, not one who the Father has given me will I lose. All that he has given me are in my hand, the safest place, and my hand is in the hand of my Father. This is all out of Yochanan John 10. If you've never done a study on that, go study it. It's wonderful. And even if you are rebellious, as someone said, don't be a knucklehead. All you're going to manage to do is jump from a knuckle to a knuckle, but you cannot jump out of God's hand. <laughs> so don't even go there. Don't bring the, the woodshed to your future. Stay aligned and receive blessing. No one is left behind. There are those who believe and say, well, the Jewish believers are left behind because they're the 144,000. Well, number one, I hope there's more than 144,000 of us right now on the face of this earth who are Jewish who believe. I don't know, but I hope so, because there's a whole lot more than that Jewish people on the face of this earth. And my whole thrust, my whole heart's cry in my mission field is to the Jew first, also to the Gentile. But I stand with Shaul Paul in Romans 1.16 because that's who God called me to. And I hope that we're not failing, myself and other Jewish missionaries, that we're failing that miserably, that there's only 144,000 that are believing. Okay? Number one. Number two, why would we have to stay behind to fill that number if we did? then we would still have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is promised in me from Ephesians 1.13 until I'm home in heaven. He can't leave me. That's why the Holy Spirit can't stay in this world in the same way he is now when we go in rapture because he's taking us through to meet the Lord in the air to receive our salvation. We claim we're saved, and we are, but we receive it tangibly when we get home. It's like someone who's told you, I have this for you. We know it's ours, but we actually tangibly, hands-on, receive it when we go get it. That's what the Lord is doing. So why would those 144,000 need to be sealed to do their job if the Holy Spirit can't leave them until they're placed in heaven? See, there's a problem there, okay? Many, many, many reasons. There is never a time in all the different changes called dispensations that we see through the course of time 
in God's eternal plan of the ages, where from one time to the next, from innocence to government, from government to promise, from promise to law, from law to grace, and then it goes back into law because it, grace is like a parenthesis. There's never a time that at the end of one of those dispensations, as they're called, in the start of the next one, that there was a cut off for salvation, that, that somebody could not get saved. Why would there suddenly be now? And where is the for God so loved the world if there's a time when someone cannot get saved? When they say, well, the ones that heard can't get saved. Well, then how are you going to start with people that have never heard and get them saved? I mean, obviously God can do anything, but that's not the way he works. Remember, he never said, you heard it a hundred times, you didn't receive it, I'm not going to let you receive it the hundred and first time. The only time we cannot be saved is when we have made that final, solid rejection. There will never be a change. We are so hardened that we have sinned away our day of salvation, and none of us can judge it about another human being. None of us can. My dad's been witness to for ten and a half years, and I'm talking head-to-head head head witnessing. I'm talking constant. I'm talking all kinds of miraculous ways that this man has been brought in my dad's life. And at ten and a half years, he says, don't ever talk to me about that name again. I don't want to hear another word. I'm going to, I was born a Jew. I'm going to die a Jew. He was anathema to it. And that one could have even chosen to give up, and God would have sinned in another, but he didn't. He came back at my dad with, good, die a saved Jew. <laughs> and he hung in there, and two and a half years later, my dad is so thankful to eat those words mm -hmm. as he's opened his heart to the Lord. No one knows when that final rejection has been made but God, and God alone can judge that. Until they made that final rejection, it doesn't matter what, what day they live in, what period they live in, they have that chance for salvation. Now, the rapture has occurred. They, wow, Rochelle told me about this. Rochelle told me this is what's coming. Rochelle said I needed to get saved or I'd find myself on the other side of this day. But Rochelle didn't say it's all over. I'm going to go to hell and I can't do anything about it. She told me if, that, if I find myself there getting to the Bible, ask for salvation, God will grant it and he'll be my partner through whatever days I have left, whether I make it seven years or whether I make it one year. But if I make it all seven, I know there's a hope of the return of my Savior them and I will be in that time also. Whichever way it goes, whether it's by martyrdom or whether it's by making it through the seven years. I think the first one saved, the majority are going to be those who heard already, who had seeds planted in their heart, seeds watered, but they had not come to that final acceptance or rejection. And they were, as we say, on that fence Maybe they even seemed adamantly opposed until suddenly the reality of it has hit them right between the eyes. And now they're scared enough to get into that word of God and get saved. They're the ones who are we're talking about that are saved during the tribulation period. And that can be Gentiles and Jews that I just described. The Jews that get saved after the rapture, God chooses 144,000 of them and seals them. And I believe that happens early on. So I do believe that the great testimony of the disappearance of we believers is going to have an impact. Those who we have been witnessing to, it is going to have an impact. Now, I'm not telling you, go tell everybody you're going to disappear because most of them are going to say, mm, you're Meshuggah, you're crazy. But as you develop that relationship and that comes out, I do believe that that there is a great number who will be saved. Now, ask me how many get martyred during the tribulation, and I'll take you to Revelation 10, I think it is, where they're under the throne, obviously martyred, crying out for, Lord, how long, how long until you avenge our blood, our blood that was shed because we believed in you. And it's described as a number so large from every tongue, every <coughs> tribe, every nation, and it cannot be numbered. That means that we can't count that high. So obviously many get 
saved, hallelujah, during the tribulation, that many of them will go to their death in martyrdom during the tribulation. And I'd rather spare anybody I can that. So I'm going to talk now, preach it now, teach it now, live it now, and pray that they will accept. But your responsibility is not for them to accept. Your responsibility is to give them the message. Their responsibility is what they do with it. So don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Maybe it's ten and a half years with somebody. Maybe it's longer than that. We've got a beloved 98-year-old who my dad started with in 1957. So we're talking 60 years that he's had a witness. I pray God's extended this man's life because he'll yet accept. And even now, my heart's praying, Lord, save him, save him. Never give up. Always be a witness. When you can't use words, let your actions show. Let your life show. You have no idea how they're watching you. In fact, sometimes your actions speak so loud, they can't hear a word you're saying. Mm -hmm. So you're saying the 144,000 went up with the body of Christ? No. No, no, I'm saying that. that the believers, everyone who has Jesus in their heart at the time of the rapture goes up to be oh, with the Lord. The 144,000 are made of the people who got saved after right. the rapture. The goats and the sheep. Now, is that that during the tribulation period? They would be part of the sheep. Because, they would be. Yeah. So would they be going up with the sheep? The if they, that's what we were saying. She's asked me, are the 144,000 part of the sheep then? Does that mean that they go into the millennial kingdom yes what i can't say dogmatically is whether they experience martyrdom during the tribulation after their work for the lord was done or whether they make it all the way through i think at least some make it all the way through but i don't know whether they all do or not oh, so they um, might be martyred they may be martyred after the work is done they can't be you know it says to, let's look real fast revelation 14 it says that they're to be sealed until their work is accomplished. That's why I can't tell you. If it takes them seven years for their work to be accomplished, then they make it all the way through. If their work's done in, in three years, they may be martyred in the last part of the tribulation. Um, it doesn't really say. Uh, maybe it was Revelation 7. Okay, let's go back to 7. It might be in 7 where it says it. That's the two chapters that talks about them. I thought it was in 14. It's seven, and of course, it's coming to my mind immediately. The start is seven. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. That means it's global, okay? North, south, east, and west. Whether you see literal corners, whether you see rounded, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's the whole earth. Holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth, on the sea, on any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. Here's the seal. He cried out with a loud voice to those four angels who were holding back the winds, he, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. So those four angels that are holding back the winds, there when they let go, what's going to happen is earth and the sea are going to be harmed. But they're told in verse 3, do not harm the earth or the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. Mm -hmm. That's where I answered that question about whether they're just sealed with the Holy Spirit. Yes, they have the Holy Spirit within absolutely to do what they do, but I see a seal on their foreheads that is identifiable. That's why I believe the Antichrist comes up with his counterfeit to put his name on their forehead. Okay, those 144,000. It, it's like God choosing, you know, his team. And he puts the mark, you're on my team, you're on my team, you're on my team. And so Satan comes along and says, okay, you're on my team, you're on my team. And he brands his own. But they're, they're told, hold, hold it, wait. You can't hurt the earth, you can't hurt the sea, you can't hurt the trees until they're sealed. Why? Because they would be hurt in that. There's going to be people that are hurt when the earth gets hurt. There's going to be people hurt when the sea gets hurt. We're going to read about it. How many, you, you know, sometimes it's a third of mankind. Do you realize if you're starting with 7 billion, a third is close to 3 billion? You know, that I means we're talking a huge amount of people that are going to lose their lives. But before that happens, these people are sealed. The, they have a work that they have to be able to accomplish. They have to have 
a protective shield around them to enable them to go out into a world that is going to be hurt. A sea that's going to turn to blood and, and a third of the life in it die. An earth is going to be fire and scorch and hail and this and that. And they have to be able to get through that. So God protects them. That, that name on his forehead mm -hmm. is more than just the name on the forehead. It's like his seal all around them. So they're, they're in essence, and I don't like this, but just understand my thought. They're like Superman. You know, they can take a bullet, yeah. <laughs> but Superman has his kryptonite, so, you know, it falls short there, so and they're not, they not suffer they will not sealed. until their work is done. Mm -hmm. yeah, it says until we've sealed them on their foreheads, because they have a work that they're supposed to do. They're supposed to go out, and here's what they do. I look, behold, verse 9, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, so we know they got saved, palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. How did they get saved from all nations, all tongues? It's because 144,000 have taken their work out to the ends of the earth. So if you were, and I'm not meaning you because you're a believer and you're going to go in the rapture, but if you were one of these 144,000 and your assignment was Siberia, and you're in Israel, you're going to get all the way to Siberia, you're going to evangelize that whole area, they're going to all hear, because you're enabled to do your job before anything that happens to Siberia, because it happens worldwide, touches your life. So you'll miraculously survive an earthquake, you'll miraculously survive a hailstorm, you'll miraculously survive the fire that comes to, to take away whatever it is, they will survive it. To me, that's even part of their testimony. If people see that they survived these things, they've got to say, wow, you've got to be from God. How else could this happen? So God protects them to enable them to do the job he's given them to do. Why? Because at that time when his judgment is being poured out in wrath on this earth at the same time, Satan's letting everything he's got go at those who are the Lord's. He wants to take them out. The same way he wants to take out Israel right now, he wants to take out every believer also. And he goes after him. We know that. He goes after us like with a vengeance right now. And how much more? Roger. 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 He's asleep. <laughs> how much more? Sorry, I get his attention. We need, we need, yeah. <laughs> Is the witnesses would be the same? Yeah, they were sealed until they died. The two they witnesses died also, we'll get to them. We won't get to them today. We're not even going to finish the Antichrist today because of our little side trips. But again, I'm not here to push an agenda. I'm here for us to learn. I'm here to encourage and strengthen us in our walk for, with the Lord. If today nothing else comes out of it, but it puts one of you on a, a path that you go and you share and somebody gets saved, Hallelujah. That's what came out of this class. Every soul is precious. That would be worth it all right there. And I think every single one of you would agree with me that, that that's the whole, you know. That's the object of that's, our lessons. Every yes, week. yes, that is the that's object of our happened. lessons. And um, so I better watch. I was going to make a comment, but I'm reminded I'm on video. Pray for when I got my mind right now. You all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm leaving it right there. But obviously, absent today, I can't sit anymore. I'll get in trouble. Okay, let's, let's do move on. Um, I do believe we can at least begin to introduce the Antichrist. That's the next one on topic. Um, in the order that we laid out last week, 144,000. Then we're going to talk about the Antichrist. We'll talk about the false prophet. We'll see the difference between these two. And then we'll look at the two witnesses that we talked about who also are sealed to get their work done. And they do die when their work is done. Mm -hmm. But then they're also resurrected three days later. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see the look on the faces mm -hmm. of those who were there filming it to show the whole world and celebrating. And all of a sudden, life comes back into mm -hmm. these two. He and he's Film at 11, <laughs> whatever channel you want. I, I can see it interrupting every television program, every radio announcement, you know, because it's going to, it's, it has to rattle the cages. What I don't get is why it doesn't bring more to salvation. The hardness of man's heart. Okay. One thing. Oh. Yes, sir. When Jesus was in the Garden of Heaven and they asked, 
where Jesus was and asked who he was and said, I am, and knocked them all down. And they still stood back up and they still didn't care. When they whacked the guy's ear off and put the ear back on, it's like, what is wrong with these people back then? And that's like, that scared the bailiff out of everybody and wanted to get saved right there or something. <laughs> if you didn't hear Roger, I thought the same thing, and I, I agree with what he's saying. <laughs> when our Lord Messiah lived on this earth in his human form, and when he was in the garden of Gethsemane uh, on that last night when the soldiers came for him, and when they asked him who he was, and he said, I am, and just by the power of that name, it knocked them all on their to us. <laughs> I'll give you the Yiddish word. <laughs> that that should have, yeah. you know, began to shock them and awaken them. And who are we dealing with? And you would think they'd want to say, I, yeah. I'm keeping my hands <laughs> off of this one. But at the same time, we also see Peter in his zealousness. I love Kepha. He is so zealous for the Lord. He ends up chopping off Malchus's ear. I have a feeling, right or wrong, I have a feeling he might have been going to chop off his head. Malchus <laughs> moved and never got the ear. I don't know. <laughs> but whatever. But just picture it. You see an ear on the ground. You see the Sia pick that ear up. Oops, not Sia. Yeah. And put it on his head. Not on this. So yeah. And he can hear it. <laughs> yeah, he can hear it. I mean, the ear, he doesn't like go and it falls back off. You know, we all know this defies everything we know. That there would convince me. Though. And Pam saying that would convince her. And we would think it should have convinced those soldiers. But remember, Messiah's been doing those kind of miracles in our midst. And many came just to see the miracles, but they didn't take it in personal. I don't get it. I don't understand. And they say, don't talk till you walk the mile in the moccasin. So maybe I have no right to critique, but I'm with Roger. It's like, how can you see a manifestation like that? How can they see these two witnesses and what they do? We'll talk about it when we get there and not to believe. How can they see them literally raised from the dead and not say, we know sometimes they do. Remember even when Yeshua was giving his life on the cross, when he had said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Amen. He showed who he was because remember the, the, those going by were saying, you know, if you're who you say you are, take yourself off the cross, save yourself. Yeah. Well, he could have, and we know he could have, but he didn't sure. because of his love for us. But his whole testimony, the way he handled it all, what he said, that Roman centurion, which means he was not a follower of the true living God. He was not in the commonwealth of Israel, but seeing that testimony, he said, surely he is the son of God. There's your witness. That one, I believe, found salvation. He knew who he was. And I believe... Far and few, far and few. I don't get it. I don't get it. How do you have such pride in heaven, in the presence of a holy God who has blessed you abundantly, and you have the audacity to say, I want your place and I want your worship? Why do you think pride's one of the sins God hates the most? And why do you think lie is right there with pride? Mm -hmm. And what's in the middle of pride? I, the letter I. Okay, Antichrist. <laughs> I'm sorry? The in. The in. Oh, pride, yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. <laughs> but for the grace of God, go I. And I humbly thank him. Not me, but I thank him so much that he reached down and he said, Antichrist does not mean in place of Christ. I want to start off right that way immediately and put your mind in the right way to look at what we'll be teaching. It does not mean in place of. He is not going to be a false messiah. He is not going to be God's equal. He doesn't have that same power and he doesn't represent uh, any of that. Anti also means against. If I'm anti something, I am against it. And that is the best way to look at the meaning of his name. Against Christ. Against the anointed one. Because Christ means anointed one. So he is against the anointed one. 
Now, why do we call him the Antichrist? How did he get that name? And by the way, I'm going to tell you he has more than one name. But this name in particular comes from 1 John chapter 2. Go with me from, to 1 John 2 and verse 18. 1 Yohanan, just outside of the book of Revelation, just back a little. And verse 18 says, Children, it's Yohanan speaking out of his love. He's like a father to his children. Children, it is the last hour. Okay, it's the final chapter. We know that's the tribulation. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know it's the last hour. Okay, in that he's telling us there's going to be one major one who is called the Antichrist, who we've been talking about. He's against the anointed one. But even now we have little ones. We have little samples. We have juniors out there that are against. And that's telling us that we are drawing into those last days. We have been in the last days a lot longer than you and I think last days mean because we think with a little finite mind that a hundred years is a long time and the Lord laughs. <laughs> because when you look at the scheme of eternity, a hundred years, he says a thousand years is like a day and a day like a thousand years. So can we be in last days a lot longer than what we would call last days? Absolutely. I believe that the last days started when we had the beginning of the uh, what we call the church, when in Acts 2 they were speaking at, in um, prophetic in tongues, and we see it as a partial fulfillment of Joel, Joel 2. If you read Joel 2, what they were to do, and you see it in Acts 2 happening, and Joel 2 says, this will happen in the last days, that I'll pour out my spirit on the men. They will have visions, or the old men will dream dreams, and the young men will have visions. When you see that happening in the beginning of the church family, I believe that shows that the last days started then. The last days will go all the way through, and depending on how you look at it, either incorporate the thousand years of millennial kingdom or go right up to that time. We'll talk about that as we get closer to that. But last days are not just the 50, 60, 70 years we're talking about in our lifetime. Now, before you jump on the bandwagon and say, well, then how do we know that the Lord isn't coming for a thousand more years? In honesty, we can't say that we do know that he's not, but we can be pretty good detectives. And when we see a whole picture coming together, when we see everything happening in a way that it hasn't before, and when we take in other prophecies that tell us, when you see this, you'll see this, and we use Israel as our marker, then we know we are coming to a very short period of time left. And we could be down to final years, final moments before rapture, final years called the tribulation easily on the basis of all those prophecies that are out there that have and are coming together. We do not know exactly how much we will see before we go home to be with the Lord, but we know we will not see the Antichrist as being who he is. In other words, he may be alive and well on planet Earth today, and if we're right about how close the rapture is, he is alive and well. He's even an adult. He's not even a little kid if the rapture happens today or tomorrow because he's got to be able to step into that position. He's not going to have time to grow up. So he could be in this world, but we're not going to know who he is. That's very clear to us in 2 Thessalonians 2, and we will go through that when we're ready for that. That's not my point for right now. I'm going to back us up, but I'm giving you this broad overall before we hit the details because we need that whole picture. Um, and I've even derailed myself where I was going now with telling you that reason. Um, uh, I know he's talking about it being last day. Oh, how do we know? I believed before the pandemic came on this earth that the rapture could have occurred. Because the only thing left that, that has to happen, prophetically speaking, is for the last member of the body of Christ to be come in to come into salvation. That's also why get out, get people saved, folks, so we can go home. <laughs> yes, yes. But God alone knows who when that last person is. When that body is made complete, he says, then I'll take them home and I'll go on with the time for Israel that I have promised to Israel. 
That's why we call this the time of the Gentiles, but we see the time of the Gentiles goes all the way through the tribulation. We know that, that the fullness of the Gentiles is the fullness of the body, is how many are saved that are going to go home in rapture. So, when we see all these signs of how the, what happens in the tribulation can happen, we know we're close. We're closer than 100 years ago when they had to wonder how on earth could there be a mark that could control people. And now it's nothing. With the technology of today, the chips and everything else, nobody questions how the Antichrist can have control through a mark. Everybody knows it's possible. But did we take, in my humble estimation, a giant step closer to the tribulation with this pandemic? And I'll say a resounding yes. Did we ever think we would see world control the way we are seeing it? Do you see how everything is setting up? Because this is the first time we have dealt with a worldwide mm -hmm. epidemic. Mm -hmm. We've dealt with epidemics in areas, but this is the first time it's affected the entire world. Mm -hmm. And we're told we have to act this way because of China and because of another country over there. And they have to act a certain way because of us. And we see how quickly the independent, thank you very much, United States of America, was quick to give up freedoms and isolate ourselves. And we're doing it to this day. We're on Zoom. <laughs> and we're forced to because if we go meet, we can get our host church in trouble. And so we choose not to do that to them. What they can't do is silence our mouths. They cannot silence the Word of God. They cannot take our testimony from us. They can take our life from us, but our last words are going to be speaking for our Lord, if that be so. But when you see all of this change, when you see that the, we're being taught to world think, and now we're even seeing how they're beginning to form the world religion. Let's bring all these religions together. Let's have them all under the same auspices that they can all do this, they can all do that, but uh-uh, they can't do this. All of these that we're seeing, all these different things that are happening right now, the loss of the middle income, we're starting to see very rich and very poor only. And what do we see in Revelation 6? When the four horsemen come across, we see famine, war, pestilence, death. We see that, that they work all day to buy a bag of bread. We understand how that could happen now. We've got people right now that their whole income wiped out that don't know how they're going to live their final years because there's no retirement now. Their company bellied up. They can't provide them with money when they went under. There's so much that we can see and understand. Open up the book of Revelation and read it again, and you see how it can hit the world, and you see how it can affect the world, and you see the interaction. Now, do I say we jumped into the tribulation? No. My niece is going to give birth in a week. Right now, she's uncomfortable. <laughs> her best friend, who is due just two days before her, is giving birth today. Keep her in prayer. Hallelujah for her. <laughs> she's in a little closer than my Lindsay. My Lindsay's uncomfortable, but Tara is in the throes of birth pains. And as the baby's coming, those birth pains get closer and they get harder. And I remember with my sister in, in her first, her first, um, what do you call it? Labor pains. She, she was like, whoa, okay, that's a labor pain. Well, by the time she had her first baby, she said, those were nothing. Those were little hiccups back there compared to what it was in the end. You all know this. I'm talking to the choir. But my point is, the closer we get to the birth of the tribulation, the, we get into these birth pains. We get closer. We see it. We know the baby's coming. We will not see the baby born, but we will go right up to the birth of that baby. We're going to have big birth pains. Well, hello, pandemic. I call you one mighty big contraction, and we all are saying, ouch. <laughs> but. That hallelujah, too. <laughs> exactly. Hallelujah. Use it. Let it be jet fuel. Get out there and get the word out, because that's how close we are. So. We have the Antichrist, we have the spirit of Antichrist against Christ in this world today. If you don't believe that, then ask me why John Lewis can have a service 
with people sitting close to each other, talking, singing, and honoring the, the beloved death. I'm not belittling him at all, but I know people right now that are waiting for the service for their loved one who died months ago, mm -hmm. and they can't hold the service because we can't have a service mm -hmm. while we're under this. You can't gather more than 10 people, and you can't wow. sing, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. We don't Same see justice here. We don't see fairness. We don't see equality. We see an agenda. And we know who's pushing behind this agenda. I could go on and on and on. Not my point to do it, but my point to tell you, when you see it, how close it is. My mom used to say, if you're going to put on a play, you build the stage. Now, if you're going to put the play on in this next year, you're going to work on that stage. And you're going to accomplish things in month two and, and month five. And by month 10 and 11, it's taken on shape. You can begin to see what kind of stage has been set. By the time you get to the, that time for the act to happen, the play to go on, the stage has been set. All that's waiting is the actors are in the wings, waiting for their clue to come on the stage and perform. Now, I'm not calling this a performance, but God has set the stage. There is nothing we need to see. The temple is ready to be rebuilt. We may or we may not see that. I've told you that before, which side we're on, but it's ready. Fifty years ago, they couldn't do that. Today, they can. That has to be in place in the first three and a half years. It's ready. I could go on and on the signs that the tribulation, that it's ready. This world is ripe and ready. It's just waiting like Lindsay is right now. Let me get birth. Let me get birth. It's waiting for that. And we'll be gone when the temple's built? Or when a we, we society could see is. it. We will be gone when you have to have the mark of the beast. To, to add, that's a three and a half year point. We will be gone before that. So we won't see the temple. We won't see we, the We could society. see the temple. We could see the temple. We don't know which side that's on. So if you see the temple, don't let it throw you. Don't let it derail your faith. We could see the temple. I kind of tend to think it's more likely after rapture immediately because I think that will even feed into that. I've given that before, so I won't go into detail now. But we don't know which side. As far as cashless society, we are moving rapidly into that right now. Yeah, yeah. Right now, they don't want us using cash because it's contaminated. They want us to use our cards. Mm -hmm. That's, again, just another sign of how close we are. God has set the stage. These actors are waiting in the wings. The Antichrist is behind the scenes. If we're right, if our timing is right, and I fully believe that we're right. Looking at the nation of Israel, I believe that we're right. There are those who believe that, that, that uh, someone has to be alive to see the return of the Lord that saw Israel become a nation. If so, that happened in 1948. They're 70 plus years old. We can't go a whole lot longer before nobody will be alive who saw Israel become a nation. All of these are signs that show us the stage is set, the actors are ready, God's going to pull up the curtain, and that pull up the curtain is pull up the rapture, and the play called the tribulation is going to go on. Wow. Okay, I believe we're... So we may see a cashless society, but not... We could. But not could. The, the temple, you said, has to be on the right side. The temple will now, be rebuilt. The temple will be rebuilt uh -huh. and in action where they're making sacrifices in the first three and a half years. Because at the three and a half year point, the Antichrist stops that puts his image in the temple and says, now you don't come to worship your God, you come and bow down to me. You worship me. Mm -hmm. Now, if there is no temple, if there's been no sacrifices going on, then he can't enter into it and stop the sacrifices and demand his, the worship that he's going to demand. So obviously it has to be there by that midpoint. Now, well, wouldn't the Antichrist be on the scene by the time they build the temple? And you know we're out of here if the Antichrist is on the scene. He, I, he's on the scene, if we're right, he's on the scene right now, but not identifiable. Not identifiable. Let me give you this analogy. Years ago, um, Nasser was in control of Egypt. Nasser was a horrible dictator. Vendetta against Israel, Egypt and Israel border, very unfriendly, constant problems. Nasser was horrible. Sadat was underneath Nasser. Everybody thought Sadat was nothing but a yes man, that he just followed and did exactly what Nasser did, that he was the right hand of Nasser. 
Nasser gets removed, Sadat steps in, and he immediately says, Israel, I want to make peace with you. And Israel had one of her best times on the, the Egyptian border when Sadat was in power before he gets assassinated for being a friend of Israel. Arafat. I'm sorry? Arafat. Arafat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's believed. Who raised up and formed what's called the PLO, who yeah. is the group that's calling themselves the Palestinians, who say that they have right to that land, etc., etc. Not here to give you that lesson, but that's just the overall. But my point is, there could be one right behind the scene now who nobody's seeing him as anybody who's got any real power, real authority, real voice, but he's a key in a key position, and God will play his chess game, and he'll move those pieces around, and poof, and this one will be right there in the position to be the Antichrist. So he's brewing right now. If we're right on the timing, I believe he's brewing right now, yes. Wow. Yes, wow. I do. I am not going to call out names because I think that's ridiculous. God yeah. didn't say yeah. we would know who. He that's just right. told us what he will do. So I won't buy in and waste my time trying to figure out who he is. I may ask God out of curiosity on the other hand, but I don't even know if I'm going to bother to care to know at that point because there's going to be far greater things to focus my mind on. Uh, and we'll know at the end anyway because we come back with him to put a stop to the Antichrist and we will watch Antichrist be cast into the lake of fire. So we'll know who he is at that point. But we will not know him in his position as Antichrist before the rapture. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Just to be sure, I got it all clear sure. from our last lessons. The world peace will not, uh, we will not see world peace. I do not believe we'll see world yeah. peace, no. Okay. We okay. see the no, attempt, no. No. but we will not see it because I think it's going yeah. to take the Antichrist and the that. faults to yeah. do that, yes. And we I'm don't read that anybody else it. makes peace, world peace, apart from the Antichrist. And we'll go into this. Obviously, we're getting no farther. We're going to start with the Antichrist next week, but at least we got his first name out there. He's got many names, and we'll, we'll go into them because they identify who he is. And I don't mean mm -hmm. John Hancock. I mean they identify his character the same way the names of God give us his attributes and his character. So we'll, we'll be looking at the character of the Antichrist by his names. Mm -hmm. But, um, oh, no, what did you say? What did you ask me? World peace. We were World peace. About Thank peace. you. I think, I, I think I'm getting brain fatigue. <laughs> um, we will not see world peace until it is a false peace. Mm -hmm. That has to center on Israel and the Arab nations that are at war with Israel. Because that's what God tells us. Daniel 9, this one who is called the Antichrist, will make a false treaty with Israel, will make Israel believe that she is in peace, say, you can dwell in peace, we'll promise you security, we'll promise your borders are safe, etc., etc. Okay? That's going to help us identify where this Antichrist comes from. Because who is the enemy of Israel? The Antichrist. Well, yes, the Antichrist, but in general, the Arab nations. Oh. The United States is not at war with the Antichrist. So all of you who think that the president is going to be the Antichrist can throw that <laughs> out. <laughs> and don't bring it back, because when I hear it, I just cringe. I know. We are not at war with Israel. We are not the ones that need to make peace with Israel. We are with Israel. They are. We are allies, and we will encourage Israel to make peace with the Antichrist, unfortunately, but that's part of God's plan. But we are not going to produce the Antichrist. Um, I will show you more reason than that, but I need to get that out because I can't believe when people think that. And they've thought that about probably almost every president in my lifetime, I've heard that. So it's not just because of today, even though today is very turbulent um, I believe we're seeing a weakening of the United States because the United States is not a power player in the tribulation period. We'll talk about that as that comes up also. So again, all of this is feeding into all yeah. of that. I was told the Antichrist would be Muslim and Jewish, but he has the <laughs> Jewish part has to be on the mob side because that's where the roots are. Is yeah. that true? Pam just said she's heard that the Antichrist has to be Muslim and Jewish. That he'll have to have a Jewish mother so that his Jewishness is right. 
and he will be Muslim because that's his choice of religion. I believe that is false. Oh, okay. I will show you why I believe that's false on many, 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 I'll give you a number of reasons why I do not believe that's true. Oh, okay. um, they, they're mixing things, they're mixing, short answer, because we're past time, short answer, they're mixing the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're trying to make the two one. They are not one. They are two separate characters. If you think for a moment that the one who is touting the Muslim faith is going to be trusted by Israel, no. No. Muslim would not be. Uh, but that's a very weak answer. I have much more from Scripture where I will show you who I believe he, he to be because I do believe he's going to have the Muslim belief. And I'll show you that from Scripture, that he's not Jewish. You can't put those two together. Oh. Antichrist is not Jewish. See, here's where they get that the Antichrist has to be Jewish. He's a fake Christ. Well, remember I told you that's not what it's saying. He's not in place of Christ. He's not a fake Christ. He is against Christ. So right there, their reason why he has to be Jewish gets thrown right out. And again, who makes peace? Someone who's not at war with you or someone who's at war with you? Someone who's at war with you makes peace with you. Is a Jew at war with a Jew on the level of countries? Is Israel divided against herself so a, 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 a Jew could make a peace treaty with a Jew to fulfill Daniel 9? No, it doesn't make any sense at all. But is an Arab at war with the Jew? And can an Arab say, I'll make peace with you? What has Netanyahu been on record saying repeatedly? We do not have a partner for peace in the Arab world. He has said it again and again and again. They keep saying, Israel, it's your fault. You're doing that. Now you're making more homes in Jerusalem. How dare you make more Jewish homes in the Jewish capital of the Jewish state? That's wrong. Well, <laughs> sorry. Soapbox. You know where I go with that. But again, why? It, it makes no sense that a Jew makes a peace treaty with a Jew. But an Arab who it says, you know what? Build those homes in Jerusalem. Live in peace. Build your temple. We're going to live side by side. Is there going to be two states? I'll answer that next week. <laughs> How's that for cliffhanger? So Does the Bible show us two states? So Ishmael would... would you know, because he was half and half. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be somebody like Ishmael. Someone like Ishmael? No. No. Because, again, you, you've got... You, there, he, I, he just can't be Jewish. Give me time. Let me show you who the Antichrist okay. is. Let me show you who the false okay. prophet is. And you'll have your answer. Okay. So, no, I do not believe that they have a right understanding of Scripture. And wow. if you've got verses from them, bring them on, and I'll answer those verses. And I'll give you my verses for my reason. Okay. Because... It doesn't matter what Rochelle says. Remember my mantra? Don't go out of my class and say, well, Rochelle says. That's the worst <laughs> thing you can do my to notes. me. <laughs> but say, the Bible says. <laughs> Don't read your notes. Shame Don't on your you pants. You've been in my class long enough. <laughs> the Bible says. The Bible says. That's our authority. That's where we go. That's where the answers are. And do we get it 100% right? None of us do. But when we can have verse after verse after verse after verse, when we can answer what they try to bring out, then we can be pretty secure in where we stand. And I'm very secure where I stand because of the depth of study, the Word of God, not because of Rochelle, not because of anybody else, but because of the Word of God. So... I'll take you through the Antichrist. Maybe we'll even, if we don't do any off, but again, i leave that in the Lord's hands. We might get through the Antichrist and the false prophet, but that's a lot. Um, I, I think we, we may or we may not. It just depends on how fast we travel. But by the time we get through the next two classes anyway, if not one, I believe that you will be very confident in saying whether the Antichrist is Jewish or not. I think you'll have more answers than that, but I think you'll be able to defend your reason for a yay or a nay. Okay? So, um, I'm going to close this in prayer. Something's popped up and I can't see half the faces again, Roger. Um, I'm going to close this in prayer and open it for comments. 
I, I trust when we take our little side trips, it does not trouble you. Um, please know we're here. Yes, we will teach what we said, but we're here for our full learning. So I, I hope it's okay with you. Let's Rochelle? Go. Yes, Rochelle. Rochelle. Yeah, before you pray, I just got a text. My sister uh, has a CT scan and they found cancer. So if you'll play, pray for my sister, Susie. Susie. I just got it when we were having the study. And this is the sister you've gone to help okay. several times, isn't it? Yeah, she's the Thank one you. that has uh, lupus. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, just, I just got the message. Okay. Lord God, our hearts hurt. They hurt for Rosa. They hurt for Susie. They hurt for her family. We know that when we hear the word cancer, it just takes our breath away. Yet, God, you are still on your throne, and you are still in control. And we ask you, Lord, to step into this family in such a real way that you will immediately seize that fear that that word is put into them, and you will throw it out in the deepest of seas, and it will not come back to any of them. We pray that your shalom will replace that fear that you, you will show them that you are in control, that Susie and her doctors will know that you are orchestrating in her life, that that word cannot end her life one day sooner than you ordained before she was even born, and that she cannot extend that day one day longer than what you've ordained. And Lord, our prayer and our hope is she goes home in rapture with us. We pray that you will be with this family, that you will reveal your love and your grace, your wisdom in every decision. Lord, that you will just go before them, and they will be amazed and in awe at the testimony that comes out of this. Lord, you know that Susie's health is precarious before cancer. And you know that Rosa wants to be at her side to help her and is not right there right now. But remind Rosa that you are the greater comfort and the greater strength and the greater help. And then give to Rosa all she needs to so that when she goes physically, she will be so strong in you that she will be able to be a real support and a real help and a real encouragement to Susie. Lord, thank you that you are not lost in this situation. You didn't lose control, that you are allowing this, that you might be glorified in it. We don't always see and understand, but Lord, we know where we cannot see your hand and where we don't know your plan, that we can trust your heart. And we know that your heart is nothing but love and nothing but grace and mercy. So may it prevail from start to finish, and especially, again, even at these very first moments, Lord, take the spirit of fear away and replace it with your shalom. Only you can do that, Lord, but we plead with you to do so. And we thank you for the words today, Lord. May we realize time is short for all of us, no matter what, whether it be a, a car accident, an illness, or the rapture. Time is short, and we need to serve you now. Do what we need to do now. Be your representatives now. Get the word out now that those we know can go home with us also. So, Lord, take us. Light us on fire for you. Send us out. May we not miss opportunity to speak for you. And may those hearts be prepared to receive the word that as we open our mouths, Lord, you fill it, that we not say anything we shouldn't, and only what you know will touch the lives of those who will be hearing. Thank you that it is your spirit in us that does the work, that we just show up and you do everything else. So, Lord, we thank you. And we thank you that we know that we know that we know, no matter when it is going to happen, we will be home with you when we leave this earth. Hallelujah. We praise you and we thank you. And we want to give you glory forever and ever. And you are going to let us do that. So, hallelujah again in your name. Amen. 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 Take us. Okay. <laughs> Take I'm done saying.